will tell you something about the standardization and certification of bioplastics. This is uh, an important aspect of bioplastics. We've heard about the materials, uh, and that's one side of it, but then you need to organize it in a way. And that's where uh, standardization and certification comes into play. Uh, uh, um, I'm here actually uh, as a representative of a project that I'm coordinating. This is a uh, international uh, project. It's called Plastica, or it has a very long title, Innovative Value Chain Development for Sustainable Plastics in Central Europe. And I have no idea why Croatia is not included in the Central Europe area as defined by this program. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm here. This is a program that we started uh, last year, so 2011, and we focus on the identification and removal of barriers for a faster and wider application of bioplastics. The idea was that in Western Europe, they're using a lot more bioplastics than in Central Europe or Eastern Europe, uh, and that we need to uh, assist in building up this momentum. Uh, we have the purpose of promoting environmentally friendly, sustainable plastic solutions throughout the complete value chain. And one of the expected results of our project is to establish certification portals, and I'll say maybe something more about that, uh, for compostable plastics in Slovenia and Slovakia, because we don't have this possibility at the moment, so that's one of the uh, goals that we have. We have 13 partners for, from four countries, and here you can see actually the value chain. We have uh, the whole value chain pretty much represented from producer. We have Novamont as part of our project. Uh, then we go through some Slovenian companies as well, uh, up to waste management, and this is complemented by uh, academic or let's say knowledge uh, organizations which can support. And the idea is that we can uh, support the value chain and check the uh, sort of problems in the value chain and try to uh, solve them in a way. Uh, we are also trying to uh, reach beyond the Central Europe uh, area because we believe if we create this information and these possibilities, it's very easy to replicate them elsewhere. So it would be a waste not to. Uh, let's go. Uh, so if we talk about bioplastic, or if I talk about bioplastics, I'm actually um, using the definition that's uh, used by European bioplastics as a major uh, European association in the area. And that means that bioplastics are bio-based, biodegradable, or both. And of course, this uh, is a very diverse group of materials. Because we can either, if we look at sources, use fossil sources, we can mix fossil and renewable resources, or base it entirely on renewable resources. And in each of these uh, source uh, possibilities, we can either have biodegradable or non-biodegradable uh, materials. So from this whole group, there is only one that doesn't fit into bioplastics. Uh, that's only um, if, we <laughs> uh, if we use fossil uh, sources and then we go into uh, non-biodegradable materials. That's the only part, actually, that is not uh, under the title of bioplastics. And those are, in fact, the normal plastics we use, the conventional plastics. So if we go on. So of course, why do we want to standardize bioplastics? Well, the problem is, in fact, that when you get uh, a bioplastic in your hand, like for example this, this is a PLA cup, and it's very difficult, in fact, to distinguish it from anything else, from like polystyrene or something like that. You will not have you know, the immediate idea that this is a bioplastic and perhaps it should be uh, considered or dealt with somehow differently. Uh, also, uh, there, there are different opinions. People have different opinions, what, what is biodegradable, what is not, to what extent, and so on. So you can overcome differences like that. And in fact, you can, uh, to a large measure, prevent false advertising. People like to sell their materials as eco, green, friendly, I don't know what. Uh, and 
it's never quite clear what that means. It sounds good. And then people often ask you, what is it? And you tell them, well, it's nothing. Uh, and in fact, uh, standardization is a basis that gives a guarantee to consumers and also a tool for producers. So, so it serves both ends of the market. Really. Uh, and the question is, how can we implement this standardization? How is it implemented? Well, standards are developed and published by standardization organizations. This can be international, like ISO or CN for Europe, ASTM in the States, in Japanese, and so on. In Slovenia, we have CIST, you have HZN. Uh, and each standardization organization has its own standards, which is a little bit confusing. But they have different statuses. For example, CN is obligatory for all EU member states. Uh, so you, for example, in Croatia also have a number of CEN standards that you've already uh, implemented. Uh, for the rest of the world, so outside Europe, it's quite common to harmonize with ISO standards because they are uh, international. And if we look at standards, we have two types of standards. We have specifications, where you have actually a requirement that a material must fit. So it's a pass-fail. Either it is, let's say, a bioplastic, if we say so, or it's not, and that's it. You have a measure. And then you have test methods. They come under different names and different systems. Uh, let's say it can be a practice, determination, evaluation, or something like that. But this is only a method. It just tells you how to measure it. So you will measure it correctly. But it gives no judgment what it is, really. So it's important, actually, to distinguish between these two. And if we look at uh, the wild world of standards and bioplastics, there are more than 100 standards that you can find that are current in different systems, different countries, and so on. And uh, so if we look from bioplastics, we can go into bio-based. And down here, perhaps a little bit hidden, is the legend what these little dots mean. Green is test method, and red is a specification. So a specification is something where you can have a pass-fail condition. So if you look at bio-based, we have standards. There aren't that many, very few in fact, but they're only test methods. We don't have a specification here, and I'll talk about that more. If we go into biodegradable, well, biodegradable by itself means nothing. If you don't say where it's biodegradable, in what way. So that, that doesn't have any specific uh, sort of uh, uh, standardization behind it. But you have specificity when you define the conditions. Now, the most commonly used method is uh, compost. So you want compo compostable plastics. and most of the work is done on industrial composting. Here you can see we have a whole list of test methods and also a number of specifications from different uh, systems. So we can talk about ISO, CEN, and ASTM, and so on. The other option that we have is home composting. That's what we have at home. And it differs from industrial composting in the fact that it, goes, it takes place uh, at lower temperatures. That's the only difference, really. Uh, here we have only one specification. That's Australian. And we have a number of test methods. So you can see here we have a, a really big collection. Everywhere else, much less. We have this, a similar situation with anaerobic digestion of bioplastics. Uh, we don't have a specification. We have test methods. Same for uh, biodegradation in soil. No specification just test methods. Uh, in water, we have one specification. Others are only test methods. So you can see it really all focuses on industrial compost methods. See? That's it. Perhaps I should mention oxidegradable plastics. I don't consider them to be biodegradable, at least not at the moment. I think they will be sometime in the future. Uh, and they, they also have two uh, test methods and no specification. If we look at these methods that are defined in the standards, 
the most known one, and the first one actually is, well, not the first one. The first one was a Dean standard, but the uh, most, most common, commonly used uh, standard is the EN 13432, which talks about compostable plastic packaging. So this one's only for packaging. Then later on, another EN 14955 was made, which is almost the same, effectively the same, but it doesn't relate only to packaging. And then you have, again, effectively the same uh, standard that ISO developed. So it's this number. And if we look what we, what we must achieve to be you know, uh, suitable for industrial composting, uh, according to these standards, we have to uh, fulfill several criteria. One is that the material disintegrates. That's about 90% within tw uh, 12 weeks. And the test is done well, with, uh, of course, defined conditions. But so that uh, after this period, less than 10% of particles bigger than 2 millimeter can be found. Then we have uh, heavy metal content requirements. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, then we have to uh, check biodegradability. Uh, so biodegradation is in fact checked by uh, respirometry, by conversion of carbon from the polymer into CO2. And this must be achieved above 90% within 180 days, so that's uh, six months maximum. Uh, and you have a control and so on. And then there's also a check for a negative effect on plant or ant plant toxicity uh, by germination of uh, uh, two types of plants. If we compare the different standards for composting, these are all one, two, three, or for industrial composting. Only this one is for home composting. Uh, if we look at them, you will see that all these standards are quite similar. The ASTM standard uh, is different from these three by that that it has higher uh, limits for heavy metals, 10 times higher for the US, about three times higher in Canada. And it has a different requirement for the mineralization point. Uh, if you have a homopolymer, the requirement is 60% conversion to CO2. And if it's a copolymer, then it has to achieve 90% just like here, and the time is the same. Otherwise, it's all the same. So you can see they're very well harmonized. Uh, same goes for the Australian uh, standard, which has only another biological test, not only for plants, but al also for worms. So we have for uh, animals, let's say, in the soil. Uh, the the standard that's actually quite a lot used uh, for home composting is also Australian. And here we have the time uh, for the disintegration, twice as long. So it's not 12 weeks, 24. And also for the mineralization, the time is twice as long. And of course, temperature lower. And it also has the worm test at the end, just like in this one. So these would be the you know, basic differences between these uh, uh, standards. <coughs> for that's for compostable plastics, of course. If you look at bio-based, uh, bio-based, of course, means uh, using renewable resources. And the basis for the measurement here is the concentration of the C14 isotope. This is like carbon dating. It's the same thing. Uh, C14 is, uh, uh, is made by cosmic rays out of nitrogen, actually. And we have a very low concentration in all living organisms. We, we breathe it all the time. It's like one part per trillion. So that's 10 to the minus 12 concentration. Uh, and the half time of C14 is about 5,700 years. So in fossil uh, sources, you will have a negligible, indetectable, uh, concentration of C14. So if you have a plastic made from fossil resources, it will not contain C14. If you have it made from bio-based materials, then it will have a C14 concentration very similar to us because uh, it's, it's not very old, in fact. 
Uh, and that's the basis for the measurement of bio-based content. This is important because you can make, for example, polyethylene that is bio-based. They're, they're doing that in Brazil from uh, sugar cane, ethanol, and so on. So you have polyethylene that's effectively the same as the one made from fossil fuel uh, sources. And when you look at it, when you analyze it, whatever you do with it, you will see no difference. The only difference is the C14 content, and through that you can see the percentage of bio-based, I mean, the percentage to which this material is bio-based. There is effectively one most established standard, that's ASTM. This one was published several years ago already, so it's very much in use now. Uh, CN just uh, this year published a standard on this topic, and the ISO is not yet uh, published, but it's being prepared. So it's, it's quite clear here uh, what is being used. At the moment, ASTM 6A66 is being used for the most part. I would just mention to you that what you get here is a result that's related only to carbon. The result is how much of the carbon in your material is bio-based. That's it. It's not a weight balance, you know, like say 50% by weight of the material is bio-based. It's only carbon. It's done on carbon because that's what you measure. Okay? Uh, and the standardization for bio-based content has requirements that uh, there should be a 50% uh, minimum of organic compounds. It should be non-toxic. And actually, I don't know why it's not uh, applicable to medical products. I, that I don't know even why, to be honest. And what you get as a result is the percent of renewable carbon. There is no pass-fail uh, criteria. You just get the percentage, which is, of course, between 1 and 100% of the carbon is based from biomass. That's the result you get. And of course, uh, the question here is, how much is enough? What do we want? Is that 5% enough to call it biobased? Is 20% enough? Or should it be 100? Okay. Linked to the standardization is, in fact, the implementation of these standards. And that's done through uh, certificates, through certification. And a certificate is a document, uh, it's actually a document, yes, which is a proof issued by an independent authority. So this is the next step from the standardization. Certification is ba based on standards, specifications, and methods. And it's a voluntary uh, process, and it's commercial. So if you're producing a product, let's say this one, and you would like to have it certified that it's, uh, let's say, bio-based, it's PLA, this should be 100% bio-based or close to, uh, you can do it voluntarily. You go to the certification organization and you arrange the business. You have to pay for it, but nobody is forcing you to do it. What you get is a document. That's the proof that you get. And you can use a logo to put onto your product. All the uh, certificates that are issued are available online. So let's say if I get this product, or I don't know, for example, a bag like this, uh, there's a logo here, and properly marked, I don't know this one is, should be, yes. Uh, properly marked logo actually has a number of the certificates on it. I can go online and check, yes, and check if this is a valid, valid certificate, to whom it's been uh, issued, and if, if it's still valid, because it has a, a time limit on it. For bioplastics, there are, in fact, uh, two certification organizations in Europe that pretty much do all the business. These are DINSERT in Germany and Vincot in Belgium. Now, if we go back to this uh, picture, where do we have the certification possibility? Well, certification is, in fact, possible all around, you can see. For bio-based, we have a number of certificates. Uh, in fact, these just represent various contents of bio-based carbon. Okay? So we'll see a little bit later. They go by percentage. 
and they're done by Vincourt and by Din Santo. Uh, industrial composting, here we have uh, Vincourt, the US, this is uh, Bioplastics uh, Institute, issues this one, Din, and uh, the seedling, this is a, a logo owned by European Bioplastics. For home composting, we have the possibility for biodegradation in soil and water biodegradation. For anaerobic, we do not have a certificate. And for oxidegradable materials, there is no certificate, which I think is a, a, a bit of a problem. Because you see, in this case, uh, all sorts of claims are OK. Because there is no way to check it. There is no proof required. And if we look at how the certification process go, you as a manufacturer, let's say, or, or user, you contact a cert uh, certification organization, let's say Dean Sertko. You give them some information about your product, the material that you're using. And then uh, you can contact an accredited laboratory, uh, which they recognize, and they do the tests. When the tests are done, uh, they go in steps. So if you fail in one step, you don't have to continue all the way. You just fail, let's say, on disintegration, and you don't go into biodegradability. Uh, but if you pass all the, or if you have okay results for all the tests, uh, the certification organization will then evaluate the results. And if they are fine, no questions, then you get a certificate. <coughs> you get a certificate. And you are <coughs> allowed to use the certification label or logo. And the buyer can recognize it. This is, of course, all based on the standards. Uh, and the valid certificate will always contain the name of the certification organization and a certification number. That's always the case. There are many documents that have the title <coughs> certificate. Let's say oxidegradable, as you will see that, you know, that the uh, material manufacturer will give you a paper, it's a certificate, and they will claim all sorts of things. But you will never see that actually a certification organization issued. That's why you have an independent uh, certifying organization that does the thing. That's why it's credible, because you go through such a system. Of course, this is costly and time consuming, but it has a marketable value. Uh, Products can be certified, whereas intermediates and additives are registered. That's the difference. You, get, you go through the same uh, process, but only for products and products. You get a cert certificate. These are only registered. Why? Because if you have a material, you can make something thick or thin. And that makes a difference for the let's say, compostability, because we're talking about compostability. If it's thin, it will degrade, disintegrate, and biodegrade much faster than if it's thick. So that's why you need to have a final product where you can actually evaluate the thickness already. Uh, all chemically unmodified materials, natural materials, are by definition compostable. Uh, you have to test also the printing dyes. If you have blends and laminates, all the parts must be compostable, and if you have uh, let's say, two walls, then they take one half of the thickness. So it's a different requirement because you will have several walls together. If you're using a registered material, let's say you decide to use, I don't know, Ecolia from BASF, it will be very easy to certify your product because uh, you must fit the thickness requirement because for each material, let's say for Ecolia, uh, the certificate or, or the registration <coughs> uh, for the material will specify for what the maximum thicknesses this material can be considered to be uh, compostable. So if you're within that <coughs> limit, let's say it's 200 microns and you have a film of 100 microns, it will just check the thickness and check by ER if in fact this is the same material as Ecovia, that you have mixed something to it, you haven't changed it. And if it is, then actually the certification of your product is quite simple. So there is 
in fact, a, a benefit of using registered materials. It's not, it's not that you have to go through the same process again for no reason. Okay. Uh, if we look at the logos, and these are for compostability, these are the standards that I mentioned before. Uh, we have the seedling, as I said, based on these standards. Dinsertko has uh, their own logo as well. And here they use the uh, same requirements as for the seedling. And if, if applicable, they use the AS4736. That's for the, with the worms. Uh, then if we go on to uh, Vincot in Belgium, they have several possibilities. They have an equivalent to, let's say, these two. <coughs> Here. And they are also can, can authorize to use the seedling logo. They are harmonized in that way. Um, they also have the OK home composting on the other standard. This is the home composting. Same in this case and in this case, home composting. Uh, and the US has its own logo. So these logos, whenever you see them mar marked with a number properly, uh, these are actually telling you that this, this product has been tested and is certified. You have an assurance that it is uh, suitable for industrial composting or home composting in these two cases. Uh, we also have other biodegradability characteristics that can be attested, and this is uh, biodegradable in water and biodegradable in soil. Now, these are only issued by the quote at the moment. If you look at the uh, certification of bio-based content, it's slightly different. Here it goes by the percent. Dinsertko has a, a scale 20 to 50%, 50 to 85, and above 85%. It's, it's not very easily uh, seen. I, I don't, in fact, like this logo very much. Uh, because you know, it just says Dien geprüft, and then you have to read what it is. And here it says bio-based 20 to 50%, or bio-based 50 to 85%, and so on. I think this is not very user friendly, in fact, but okay, that's, that's me. Um, Vincot has a similar system, but the scale is somewhat different 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, and, and above 80. And they mark it uh, with a little star. So it says, OK, bio based, and the star. So this will tell you that it's uh, between 20 and 40% bio based. OK, so when you see these. Um, you will know what they are. Dean, in fact, uh, just issued a new logo where they have the same mark, this Dean approved, and here on the side, they specify all the things that it is. So it could be, because it could be at the same time, let's say, suitable for industrial or home composting, uh, and uh, let's say bio banks. So they will tell you all the things together. Otherwise, you would get to a very um, weird situation where on your material, you might have one, two, or even three logos at the same time. So they solve this problem. Uh, let's go on. Uh, well, before concluding, uh, perhaps I would just tell you how we're um, working in our project to get the certification uh, going also in Slovenia and Slovakia. Uh, what we're establishing is a portal so that uh, producers can uh, do the whole certification process in the native language and locally. So you have effectively an organization, let's say in Slovenia it will be Slopak, that will conduct all the certification, but the, cert the organization for issuing the certificate is in fact going to be Dean Sertko. So you will be able to do all the contact with Slopak, get all the information, uh, and then receive at the end the certificate from Dean Sertko, which is recognized, let's say, all around. Europe. And the same also in Slovakia, because we think this, this will ease the process. Um, and say in Slovenia, I don't know any product that would be certified. They are made, they are marketed, uh, but none of them are certified at all. And for example, when uh, Mercator comes to me and brings me some material and asks me, is this, is this truly compostable, is this viable? <coughs> You know, I always say, well, just ask them for the certificate. And they have the certificate, it's a clear case. You know what it is. If it's not, they should certify it. It's quite simple. Yeah. 
So I think it's important, and uh, I, I hope that this will uh, start giving results uh, so, that, so that we will, in fact, enable more of the certification to take place. Uh, I hope that I've shown you that standardization and certification of bioplastics can be rather complex just due to this whole process and many standards and various uh, requirements. It's still rapidly changing, in fact. These standards are changing. So from, let's say, six years ago, when we did one analysis, it's now quite different. Uh, we have a very solid basis of test methods. It's, it's truly pretty well prepared. The technical work that went into the preparation is very good uh, in test methods and specifications. I believe that certification has a marketable value. And uh, there is a big need to inform both industry and users about this, what it does, what it means, and how it can be implemented. Because I think this will be a requirement in the market, more and more so. So with that, I would, I would conclude. Uh, if, you, if you have any questions, this is my email. This is my co-worker, Peter Horvat, who uh, has done a lot of the analysis of the system. She's sitting in the back there, and she probably knows more about this than me anyway. Uh, if you're interested uh, in more information, this is the address of our project. And we're, we also have a YouTube channel, and we're on Facebook. All our um, lectures are normally filmed, so we put them online so they can be seen. Uh, and in addition, I would invite you to take some of our publications. One about certification, about the stuff that I uh, spoke about, something about biodegradable polymers. And uh, Peter has also compiled a list of standards that you have in Croatia on this topic. So it's all here. Please take them. And I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you.